Good morning. For those of you who came expecting Preacher Lawson this morning, I apologize. Um, Preacher Lawson called me on Friday and asked me if I could teach Sunday school this morning. And I've had quite a few people in the church ask me about, I, I go off to different churches uh, a good bit and do King James classes on why we keep the King James Bible. And uh, so I've had several people ask me about doing that this morning. And, and so the Lord said, okay, so well, here we go. Um, you, you might want to ask, I, I know people think, well, why would you do a King James class in the King James church? Well, how many people in here, and don't raise your hands, but how many in here can tell me two verses that have been changed in the new Bibles? Just two. Okay. I mean, I, I would ask you to raise your hands, but I'm sure a lot of you do. I mean, a lot of you know, a lot of people in here do know, but a lot of you don't. And a lot of you, I, I would just about be willing to guarantee you that everybody sitting in this building right now knows someone who's in a perverted Bible. You've got a family member, you've got a friend, you've got somebody you work with who is in a perverted Bible. And it's, it's very, very difficult. If you've ever tried to talk to anybody about why to keep the King James Bible, it is so very difficult. The first thing they say, well, you think I'm stupid. No, no, we don't think you're stupid. I, in my car, I, I started to bring it in, but I was ashamed to bring it in. Uh, I've got the NIV that was mine that I had years ago that I thought was a good Bible. Somebody got it for me and gave it to me, and they, you know, they said, hey, this is just easier to understand. No, it ain't. The thing about it is we think by reading different versions we can get a clearer understanding of what God meant for us to know. Why? Why do we think that? Our, our minds are hardwired to think that education is better, and we're taught by the Holy Ghost. What people don't seem to realize in, in, in most cases is we are taught by the Holy Ghost. So if you had every version known to man, if you had the original manuscripts and you understood Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and you could sit down with the original copies that these people wrote, you wouldn't understand that any better than the King James Bible with the Holy Ghost being the teacher. It's simple as that. You couldn't. So what happened with me, I'll give you a, a real quick testimony with, with my getting away from the NIV and the New King James and the New American and all these different versions, uh, Gene Lawson, many of you know Gene Lawson, he goes here. Uh, I was over at the church that we used to go to and he started showing me some things. I was sitting there with the New King James on my lap and I thought I was doing real good and Gene started showing me some things. Well, he wound up showing me Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Now, if you've got anything other than a King James, well, no. I almost messed up. The New King James retains that verse. But Acts 8.37 is missing out of every new version on the market other than the New King James. Well, Acts 8.37 is where Philip is dealing with the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why would you take that out of a book? Why would you want that not in a Bible? That's what gets you where, that's what gets you saved is believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If he's not the Son of God, we're all lost. So that's, to me, that was one of the most important things I've ever seen. I'm like, I can't even believe they'd take that out. Why would they remove that from a Bible? Well, then he showed me Isaiah 14, 12. How many people in here, if, by raising your hand, do you know the name of Lucifer? Uh, I mean, Satan. <laughs> I gave it away, didn't I? Well, that was dumb. I tell you, I ain't no smarter than I ever was. Uh, the devil's name is Lucifer, okay? If you know that, you know that because of the King James Bible. In Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? All right? Well, every, every version on the market takes that out and changes it to something else. The NIV says, How are you fallen from heaven, O morning star? Okay? Well, in Revelation 22, 16, the Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So if you've got anything but a King James or a new King James, it doesn't change that either. Uh, and I'll tell you what happened with that. I, I'm 100% positive what happened with that. All these new versions came out and the NIV and all this other stuff, and they changed those verses. That makes, by the way, before I go too far, that makes Jesus Christ the devil. 
if Jesus Christ fell from heaven, then you're lost and I'm lost and there's no hope for any of us. Now, he came down. He did. He came down from heaven, but he didn't fall. See, the devil fell. And that's, where they, that's what they do. You, you take Isaiah 14, 12, and you make that morning star or day star, which is what Peter called Jesus Christ. If you make that either one of those, morning star or day star, you've made Jesus Christ the devil. You made him fall from heaven. So when I saw those things, I'm like, my gosh, how could anybody call theirself a Christian and want to take that stuff and change it and make that what it, I mean, I was in shock. I mean, really, I was. I was in shock because all those years, I got saved in 1987, and it's been about, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago that Gene Lawson showed me those things, and I'm like, my gosh, how could they do that and call themselves Christians? So I wanted to make sure uh, that that never happened to me again. I wanted to be sure what was right. So I started digging, and I started searching, and I started looking, and I, I got into all this stuff, and, and there's several, several good teachers on this, you know, there's uh, all kinds of good books. I've got a book list that I usually give out in these, in, in these uh, classes that I do on this. And, and this one is going to be super short. Uh, normally, when I do one of these classes, I have Sunday school, morning service, and evening service. Uh, and I have had them for longer than that. But it, it's so hard to decide what to put in and what to leave out. So I tried with this just to make sure I hit... The, the things that were the most eye-opening to me, you know, uh, and, and hopefully to you as well. Plus, I, I've, I've got some stuff in here that I try to make a little bit, a uh, little bit fun because people know me. They know I'm goofy. Uh, and you know what's funny? If you sit in a church and listen to a preacher, nine out of ten times, if that preacher tells a joke, you'll remember that joke when you get home. But you don't remember half of what he said, but the joke stood out, you know. And that happens with a lot of us. I mean, I'm not the only one, I'm sure. Uh, so there's some things in here that you'll find kind of funny, I hope, and, and we'll go through that. And, and um, So let's jump right in. Like I said, in the, in the New King James, what I am 100% sure they did was when, when the NIV came out and, and it was so blatantly, what I would say, satanic, uh, and so many people started they're turning on that thing. I mean, when they found out what was in there and what was not in there, uh, people started turning on it. Well, the devil said, wait a minute, I may have went too far. So he backed up and he got that new King James to come out with all those things that everybody went to. You know, Acts 8, 37 and, and Isaiah 14, 12 and Revelation 22, 16, Matthew 18, 11, where he said the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. All that's removed out of these new versions. So they put all that back in the new King James. And that way, you, every time you had something you ran to, you know, it was, back, it was there in the New King James. So that, that was a big problem for a lot of people until they started doing a little bit deeper and digging a little bit deeper and finding out, hey, these things are, are gone. These other things are missing out of there. So he left those things in, but what, what he did take out, and when I say he, I'm talking about the devil because this is the devil's hand. Just as clear as I'm standing in front of you today, this is the devil's hand. He's always messed with the Word of God. Do you know what the first recorded words that Satan ever spoke? In, in, the, in the book of Genesis, the very first recorded words that the devil ever spoke was, Yea, hath God said. He always does that. That's his goal. If you can't, he can't take your salvation, okay? If you're born again, you're born again. That can't be taken. That can't be removed from you. The only thing he can do is make God's Word of none effect to you. And Jesus told a bunch in the New Testament, you make the word of God of none effect by your traditions. Well, these things are traditions. As far as I'm concerned, these books are traditions. They're, they make the word of God of none effect. So uh, the, the New King James, they, they omit the word Lord 66 times. God, 51 times. Heaven, 50 times. Repent, 44 times. They take the blood out of the book 23 times. Hell, 22 times. Now, why would you want to take those things out? I mean, who wouldn't want those things in there? That's what I say about Lucifer. If you were the devil, would you want your name in the book? You wouldn't want nobody to know who you were. You know, you'd do the best, the best you could to get that out of there and get, get rid of that. The, uh, the phrase New Testament is found in your King James Bible, I think it's five times. Not in the New King James. It's not at all. They change it to New Covenant every time. Well, now... I understand the difference, 
But listen, that don't need to be changed. You don't need to be changing it. So they take Jehovah out completely, damnation is taken out completely, and devils is removed completely. Because they believe in one devil, not many devils and one Satan. So Acts, I, one, of, one of the verses that always stood out to me was Acts 17, 22 in the New King James when Paul was at Mars Hill and he was dealing with the, the, the bunch there that were so superstitious. And he said, I perceive in all things that you are too superstitious. Well, the New King James says, I perceive in all things you are very religious. Huh. So superstition and religion are the same thing according to the New King James. That's pretty good, isn't it? How many of you are religious in here today? Or superstitious? So I tell you, to me, one of the, the, the worst thing, and what's, what's been left in and what's been taken out. You know, if you don't know what's been taken out or you don't know what's been changed, you can gloss over some of that stuff and it never really jumps out at you. But there's some very, very important things that have been changed. And my wife has all the time uh, gotten on to me when I do these classes. I never go on to John 3.16 enough. All right, everybody in this building can probably quote John 3.16. I mean, that we learned that when we were this big, you know. You hear these little kids come up here and they'll quote John 3.16. That's one of the most wonderful things in the world. Listen, God so loved the world. That's, a, that's, the, that's the theme of the Bible is the love of God. Jesus Christ was the love of God manifest, right? So he says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what do they do? What do they take out? Begotten. Begotten. Now here's the thing. If you're reading the Bible, you, you, a lot of people pick it up and they've never, never darkened the door of a church. They've never heard the gospel. They've never heard the, uh, anything about anything about the Bible, and they just pick it up and they start reading. Well, when they start over in through Genesis, they find out in Genesis 6, 2, that there are sons of God. The sons of God came down to the daughters of men. Okay, and you keep on reading, you keep on reading. Finally, you get over to John 3, and it said God gave his one and only son. Well, there's a contradiction in your Bible if that's true. Because if God had one son and one only son, then all these other sons of God in the Bible are wrong, right? So you got a contradiction. Your Bible is wrong, if that's what it says. So if you got an NIV, you got a bad Bible, because if it's got contradictions, if it's wrong, then it can't be God's Word. God's Word is perfect. So, I mean, it's pretty simple whose Word it is. So the, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't speak Greek. I don't read Greek. But the word, the Greek word for begotten or only begotten is monogenes. That is in every Greek manuscript known to man. That is in the manuscripts that they use to translate the NIV. But they take it out. They just decided, we'll just remove that. So what was their justification for moving it or removing it? They don't give any. They don't have any. So... If you look, it's also uh, uh, only begotten son is in John 1.14 and John 1.18. It's in there, not in the NIV. They change it out there. So if you look, God has many sons. Uh, angels are called sons of God in, in Genesis 6.2, 6.4, Job 1.6, Job 2.1, and Job 38.7. Believers, those who are born again, are called sons of God in John 1.12, Romans 8.14 and 19. Philippians 2.15, 1 John 3, 1 and 2. So what's the difference? Jesus Christ is God's only begotten son. He's the only son God ever had the natural way. If you look up in the 1828 uh, Webster's Dictionary, if you look up the word begotten, it means a generation or procreation. Now, I don't have to explain to a group of adults what procreation is. Every one of you, most of you in here, I'd say, have procreated by now. And you all haven't, thank goodness. But also Israel in Hosea 11 uh, are, is called God's firstborn. God's firstborn son. Well, not born the way a woman is because God, we are begotten by the word 
according to the book. Who's the Word? Jesus Christ is the Word. So we're His sons. But He is the only begotten of the Father. And it's so important to have that in there. So if you don't have it, if your Bible doesn't say only begotten, then you've got a bad Bible. Now back again to the, uh, the New King James, it kept that in there. Because that was another verse that everybody ran to to make sure you could see that, you know, that it was all bad. So the devil put all that stuff back in, but he took some stuff out that he kept out there that you wouldn't you know, ordinarily know to run to. So in, uh, in Matthew 27, 4, when Judas went back to the, to the Sanhedrin and, and took their money back and threw their 30 pieces of silver back at their feet, he said, I have betrayed the innocent blood, the innocent blood. There's only been one innocent blood on this planet ever. You know, our blood, that's our problem. We got bad blood. Okay, we were born with bad blood. Jesus Christ's blood was perfect. That's why it was the perfect sacrifice. The Bible says in Hebrews, neither by the blood of bulls and goats. It was impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. It had to be perfect, spotless, clean blood. And that was God's blood. That's who Jesus Christ was. So when, G when, when Judas said, I betrayed the innocent blood, he knew what he was talking about. Now, the NIV removes the word the. I betrayed innocent blood. That kind of puts it down to where anybody's blood could be innocent, doesn't it? I mean, just about anyway. Um, uh, in Matthew 23, 24, he said, Ye blind guides, Jesus Christ talking, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Is that hard to understand? I don't think that's hard to understand. Well, they had to change that to strain out a gnat. They said that's a famous uh, error in the King James Bible. It's famous. Well, you don't, you don't think that he meant they, they had trouble swallowing a gnat, but they could swallow a whole camel. That'd be sarcastic, wouldn't it? I mean, see, that's, the Lord is sarcastic a lot of times, you know, God looked around one time and said, is there any God beside me? I don't see any. That's sarcasm, folks. I mean, that's, just per that's all that is. And they couldn't stand the idea of that, so they had to change that, to strain out a gnat. In other words, you take a strainer and you pour your soup through it and you get a gnat and you throw it away. That wasn't what he was talking about. It didn't have anything to do with what he was talking about. They completely changed that to make it all kinds of messed up. Now, the... Uh, the funny thing is, and I've said this here before in, in this church, the NIV removes 64,000 words from the text. That's a lot of words. They'll tell you that they don't change any of the major Bible doctrines. That's impossible to remove that many words and not change Bible doctrine. Acts 8.37, I mentioned that verse a while ago. That's a, that's a good Bible doctrine, you, you being Baptists. We believe in baptism of believers, right? So when, when Philip came to the Ethiopian eunuch and he talked to him and, and, and he read from the book of Isaiah and he preached to him Jesus and the eunuch wanted to be saved. Well, he got saved. We wanted to be baptized. And Philip said, if thou believe with all thine heart thou mayest. That's believer's baptism. He ain't going to baptize somebody that didn't believe is what he was telling him. So if you believe with all your heart, I'll baptize you. And then the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So then Philip took him down the water and baptized him. When you take that verse out and you read that verse this way, then they came to the water and he said, why shouldn't I be baptized? Well, Philip took him down and baptized him. That's baptism apart from belief. That's heresy. Okay? That's heresy. In one verse, 64,000 words removed but I can show you heresy in one or two verses so easy. So 64,000 words, this is, this is what got me. This is equivalent, 64,000 words is equivalent to the following books of the Bible. Now I'm not saying they took these books out, okay? Let's make sure that's, that's really clear. This is the equivalent of 64,000 words. Obadiah, Jonah, Haggai, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Jude. That's 64,000 words. That's a lot, isn't it? 
I mean, you stop and consider. You know, when they say that, they don't say how many Bible books that is. That, to me, that's shocking. They completely removed 17 verses out of the Bible, completely gone. Matthew 17, 21. Matthew 18, 11, which said, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Matthew 23, 14. Mark 7, 16. Mark 9, 44 and 46. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Hmm, wonder why they didn't want that in there. Uh, Luke, oh wait a minute, uh, uh, Mark eleven twenty six and Mark fifteen twenty eight, Luke seventeen thirty six and twenty three seventeen, John five four, Acts eight thirty seven, fifteen thirty four, twenty four seven, twenty eight twenty nine, Romans sixteen twenty four and First John five seven are all completely gone in the NIV. And I've got one in my car. If anybody wants to see it after service is over, I'll show it to you, and you can examine it yourself and see if these things are true. See, that's the thing. The, my whole purpose for this class is to get you interested enough or, or curious enough to start doing your own digging. Find out for yourself. Because when you go to your friend or your neighbor or your cousin or your uncle and you're going to try to show them the truth of the Bible, you need to know what it is yourself. I've got a really close friend of mine, pastors of church, and I won't, I won't say his name, but he pastors a church. And when the subject of the King James Bible comes up, he says, I believe it. I believe that book is perfect. I don't think there's one error in that thing. There ain't nothing wrong with it. It's God's perfect word. It's everything we need to know for this life and the one to come. And that's it. I believe it. But he can't tell you one reason why. Not one reason. Peter said to be ready to give an answer. Okay, we ought to be ready to give an answer. You believe that King James Bible's true? You believe it's the perfect word of God? Amen. Praise the Lord. I do too. Do you know why you believe it? Why? Do you believe it because Preacher Lawson said it? Now, I, I love my pastor. He's the smartest man I've ever met. But I don't believe this Bible because he said it. I believe this Bible because God showed me it's true. When you get that, when you get that, you can't be shaken. I mean, listen, if I believed it because Preacher Lawson said it, Preacher Jones down the road could make me disbelieve it. But I believe it because God showed it to me. Now, so I also want you to see something else. In, in Matthew 5.22, Jesus Christ speaking says, But I say unto you that whosoever, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Okay? So what they do in the NIV, they take out three words, without a cause. Without a cause. And so Jesus Christ now says, whosoever is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. You ever been angry with one of your brothers? Anybody? Boy, I have. Uh, physical and spiritual. So, whoever's angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. Well, in Mark chapter 3 and verse 5, it's speaking of Jesus, it says, and when he had looked round about on them with anger. Makes Jesus Christ the sinner, don't it? So if you've got an NIV, more than one time, Jesus fell from heaven. Jesus Christ is a sinner. If you've got an NIV, what good is that? I mean, we know that's not true. We know there's no truth in that. Jesus Christ... He is the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God. So we can't possibly make him a sinner. Now, also, in the NIV, you will not find a sodomite. The word does not exist in the NIV. Wonder why? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. There's more than that, though. See, there was a lesbian on the translating committee of the NIV. She was what they call a stylist. Now, I've got a... Uh, uh, a CD of an interview that a uh, Assembly of God pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina did with Virginia Mollencott. Virginia Mollencott was the lesbian on the, on the NIV committee. He did this interview with her, and he was very polite. He wasn't, you know, he didn't attack her in any way. He didn't, you know, uh, demean her in any way. He was very nice. And he did an interview with her, and he let her hang herself. He asked her, uh, what about the blood of Jesus Christ and it cleansing from all sin? Her response was, 
What do I need to be cleansed from? I was made in the image of God. That was, that was telling to me. I mean, that was telling to me. If you're born again, you know you had to be cleansed. If you're born again, you know you need to be cleansed more than just when you were saved. You need to be washed daily. Okay? So you got a woman on the NIV committee who's a lesbian who doesn't think she needs to be cleansed from anything. Then the head of the Old Testament translating committee was an open sodomite. That's, that's kind of shocking. Nobody ever hears that. Everybody knows about the lesbian. Everybody's heard about her, but nobody knows that the head of the Old Testament translating committee was an open sodomite. And I'm not going to use his name, but he's easy to find out. All kinds of information, all kinds of it that you can find out. Now, Virginia Mollencott has got a lot of books out. And to me, her books, uh, they ought to scare you. <laughs> they should make you stop and think, that woman had her hands in the Bible? Uh, her books, a few of her books are Sensuous Spirituality, Out from Fundamentalism, okay? Uh, and this is the description. It says, describes the movement from self-distrust to liberation theology of a lesbian Christian. That doesn't, those two, you know those two words can't go together? <laughs> lesbian Christian. That's like Christian beer joint. How does that work? There's no such thing. They don't exist, okay? So her other book are, uh, is The Divine Feminine, Biblical Imagery of God as Female, uh, Omnigender, A Trans-Religious Approach, Transgender Journeys is available. Uh, it's uh, with Vanessa Sheridan, a male cross-dresser, and then Women of Faith in Dialogue, uh, essays by Jewish, Christian, and Muslim women about their religious traditions. That's her books. That is her books. Folks, those, that's a mess. I mean, it don't take a rocket scientist to see that woman doesn't have her hands in a Bible. You leave her hands off my Bible, okay? I mean, you, you, I, the men who, who translated this King James Bible were not perfect men, okay? And I'm not standing up here saying because she's a sinner, she can't have anything to do with God's word. I'm a sinner. And I'm standing up here trying to teach God's word, okay? But this, that is a rebellious, open, sodomite woman who doesn't care what God says about anything. That's a, there's a difference in that. There's a difference in that and the men who translated the King James Bible who said they were miserable. They, they didn't have any confidence in themselves. That's why they had to trust in God to be able to translate his word. But this woman, she didn't trust in that. She trusted in herself. Now, also, one of the most important things to me about having the Word of God or the words of God is exactly that. Do you have God's words? Okay? God's words are more important than what we realize. And the, the importance that God put upon His words, unbelievable. I want, you to, I, I want to read a bunch of verses, and I'm going to try to go through them really quick because i got a lot of stuff I, I want to try to get to here. But this is, this is so important. Listen to this. Therefore, in Deuteronomy eleven eighteen, therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart. Now, before I go any further right now, I want you to understand it's not about having the message. Listen, I, can, I believe that you could take an NIV and lead somebody to the Lord. I believe you can take a new King James and lead somebody to the Lord. You can show them the truth. Enough of the truth is left in any of those that I believe you could use them. Do you, we, we got tracks back here in the back. And, and, and Todd, I know you hand out tracks, uh, or you, you always have. You can hand out a track to somebody, and they can read that track and be born again by reading that track. That's not a Bible, right? It's a track. It contains the words of God. So the words of God are what's important, not the message. Because I could take the message. Listen, I got this book up here. I'm going to show, I'm going to, I'm going to. Read a little bit out of this in a few minutes. This is hilarious. This is the Black Bible Chronicles. Now, this, this right here, you won't even believe. When I start reading that, you won't even believe it. Uh, a good friend of mine gave me that, pastors at church. He knows that I do these King James classes, and he wanted me to have that. So he, he called me up and made me come and get that. So it's about having God's words. Deuteronomy 18, 18, he says, I will raise up 
raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Proverbs one twenty three says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Isaiah 51, 16, And I have put my words in thy mouth. He said, over and over and over, it's words. Isaiah 59, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. That's important. That's very important. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip through some of these. Then the, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. In Jeremiah 23, uh, he's talking, talking here to prophets or to preachers. He said, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. What do you think they've done with that NIV? I think they stole God's words. They stole them from their neighbor. All right? He said... Uh, in Ezekiel, he's told Ezekiel this. He said, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. In Ezekiel 3, 4, And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Uh, in, in Matthew, I'm going to move into the New Testament. In Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Mark 13, 31, and 21, 30, or Luke 21, 33 read exactly the same. My words shall not pass away. Um, in Mark 8, 38, he said, uh, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Luke 9, 26 is exactly the same again. It reads exactly the same as that. Uh, in John 5, 46, here you go. For, ye ha for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Words. It's about having the words of God. Do you know that word is going to judge you at the last day? He said, the word that I speak, the same shall judge you at the last day. It would be good to have his word, wouldn't it? If, it, if you knew it's going to... You know the thing about it is here, God has to give you... His complete, perfect word. Because he's going to judge you by it, and it's not right. God's righteous. Is that true? It's not right for God to judge you by a standard you can't find. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you three questions, and I'm going to chop your head off if you can't answer them. Now guess the questions. How are you going to find out? God's righteous. He has to give you his perfect word, otherwise he couldn't be righteous in judging you with it. That's something you ought to take into consideration. Um, in John 14, 22 and 23, here, I'm going I'm to end this with this. He said, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Keep his words. You hold on to his words, he'll come to you, and he'll live with you. That's how you, that's how you know him, is by his words, right? I mean, the word, he said, the word that I speak, their spirit, their life. We need those words. We need them more than we need our, our bread that we eat. I mean, way more. All right. We're running really close to the end of time for the Sunday school class. And the world, too, probably. Um, so I, I do this little thing I call just for fun. I want to try to lighten it up a little bit and, and give you something to smile about today. So some of this stuff is more hilarious than, than, than you can ever even grasp. But uh, in Luke 14 and 5... Jesus Christ speaking, he says, And answered them, saying, 
Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? Do you know what every version under the sun changes that to? Instead of an ass or an ox, it's a son or an ox. Now, why would that, what made them think that they needed to put a son in there instead of an animal? I mean, I don't know. It says some things about their sons, maybe. I don't know. So, here's a good one. In, I got this new American standard up here. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. In, in Numbers 21.14, the Bible says this, Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord what he did in the Red Sea and in the brooks of Arnon. Anybody have trouble with that? Pretty easy? Let me, let me ask you if you could understand this. Therefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, Waheb in Sufa and the Wadis of the Arnon. That's so much easier to understand, isn't it? I mean, that's their goal, to make this easier to understand, right? Okay. I don't think it is. but So if you go over here in, in uh, 1 Timothy, in chapter 3, we're talking about the qualifications of a bishop. In, verse three, verse, in chapter 3, verse 3, it says not, well, let me, I don't even have my Bible open to that, but. Let me get that open really quick. All right, I'm getting there. First Timothy three three. For this, is, no, that was two. Uh, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Anybody have trouble with that? Y'all, y'all know what? no striker means. Yeah, can't punch nobody in the face. Okay, don't hit somebody. Will you not? I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what that says. In here, in the New American Standard, it says not addicted to wine. So the preacher can have wine as long as he's not addicted to it. You know, how many believe that's okay? <laughs> how many could imagine our pastor sitting down drinking a jug of wine? Not me. Anyway, not addicted to wine or pugnacious. Pugnacious. Isn't that so easy to understand? That is so easy to understand. Now, I want to get into this real quick. I'm almost done, folks. Almost done. Um, Black Bible Chronicles. This, is, this thing is the worst thing that has ever been done to black people in the history of what's ever been done to black people as far as I'm concerned. Because this is a serious thing. This is serious. Now, um, Andrew Young, the mayor of Atlanta, wrote in the foreword of this book, this is the last thing he wrote here, uh, this book seeks to reach many of our young people for whom the traditional language of faith has lost the power to bring them in touch with their God. The traditional language of faith doesn't have the power to bring you in touch with your God according to what he just said, okay? So that's pretty serious, right? I mean, that's, that's something serious. Now, this is, this is Genesis 3, okay? This is the serpent. And I'm reading verbatim. I'm not, I'm not going to add to this or take away from this. The sinning place is the title of this. Now, the serpent was one bad dude, one of the baddest of all the animals the Almighty had made. And the serpent spoke to the sister and asked, you mean the Almighty told you not to eat of all these trees in the garden? And the sister told him, yeah, snake, I can eat of these trees, just not the tree of the knowledge or the Almighty said I'd be knocked off. That's serious. Knocked off. Uh, there's, there's one in here where Cain wastes Abel. That's... that's here, now, you've got to understand that Adam and Eve got together so that Eve had a baby boy who she named Cain, meaning I made him. Her reason was simple. With the Almighty's help, I've made a boy. Her next kid was a brother for Cain whom she named Abel. 
That's supposed to be serious. That's supposed to be serious. Um, one more and I'll be done here. In Judges, chapter 1 and verse 14, Caleb's daughter was married and he had given her some land and she didn't have any water on the land and she came back to her father to ask for some water, a piece of land with some water. And in Judges 1, 14, it says this, And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? I don't have any problem with that. I understand that. She got off the donkey, and her dad said, What do you need? Pretty much. I cut that down to, to plain old country English. Well, now here's what the New English Bible says. Now, I, this is too much for me. This is way too much for me. As she sat on the ass... She broke wind, and Caleb asked her, what did you mean by that? I'm not kidding you. That's what it says. I got the book in my car. If you want to see it after church, I'll show it to you. That's what it says. Where did they get that? Where in the world do you come up with something like that and call it a Bible? I mean, what did you mean by that? You know? <laughs> Folks, you know, that's funny, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that I can bring some of that out and get somebody to laugh. It's good to laugh. You know, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. That's what my Bible says. But do you know how serious that is? I mean, this is serious business, the Word of God. It's, it's the truth of God that He wants us to know. And it's like my friend says, it's everything that God needs you to know for this life and the one to come. But not in, this, not in these perversions. Not in these. Now, like I said, this is like just barely scratching the surface of that. And, and I hope that I inspired somebody to do a little bit more digging. Uh, hopefully you'll get in there and, and find out for yourself what these things say. Because you've got friends and family. Believe me, you've got friends and family that have perverted versions. I've talked to people in this church, and you wouldn't think in this church you'd have that, that issue, but I have talked to people in this church who take other versions. When they don't understand something in the King James, they'll get them another version, and they'll look it up in that to try to get clarity. That's like rubbing mud on the mirror and trying to see how good your face looks. It's not, it's not helpful. Jesus Christ told his disciples, now close with this, Jesus Christ told his disciples, I have yet many more things to say unto you, but you're not yet able to bear them. God will give you the more truth you accept, the more truth you receive, the more truth you'll get. That's how that works. You accept it, he'll give it. You hold out your hands, he'll fill it up. That's what he wants to do. He wants you to know him. God's not trying to hide from you. He wants you to know him. That's why he gave you his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this good day. I thank you for this time that we've had to spend together here in the, in the Sunday school class. I pray you'd use what was said this morning for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for it. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Thank you.